So the topic, as Julie suggested for today's discussion, is between two compounds that we use very commonly in the NIQ, nitric oxide and oxygen. And we would like to see how they interact with each other and what is the benefit and harm of this interaction. And Julie, thank you for this wonderful graphic. Uh, I'm, this was pretty hot on the internet, so I'm really thankful to you for using it. The beauty of this graphic is that it doesn't tell you which one is oxygen, which one is nitric oxide, and that's the fun part here. Uh, I do not have any conflicts to disclose, except that I have been an avid user of both nitric oxide and oxygen for a long time. Uh, during my fellowship days in the early to mid 90s, and nitric oxide was not approved, but we still get it from industrial gas, dilute it down and use it in babies with miraculous effects. And these were the pre FDA approval days and have been using nitric oxide since 1996 and have been an avid fan of its use. At the same token, oxygen is a really important compound, also known as the elixir of life. And we can do without oxygen, but we really don't know what exactly are the consequences of using these two compounds in combination. And we really don't know very well as to what causes hypoxia, what causes hyperoxia, what are the exact limitations, et cetera. And we'll review some of those during the next 45 minutes. Okay, let me start with discoveries of each of these compounds. Uh, and the first question I have for you is who discovered oxygen? And there are three names here, three choices for you. So I want you to go ahead and use your chat button and type who the answer. Who do you think is the discoverer of oxygen? Who discovered oxygen? Let me give you a few seconds to answer. So here are your cho three choices, Joseph Priestley, Carl Scheele, and Antoine Lavoisier. Okay, Vinayak says Joseph Priestley, good. Any other answers? Okay, lots of people in favor of Priestley, great, okay. So it's good, if that means to me that uh, many of you still remember your chemistry textbooks that you read in your eighth grade. And uh, let, let's look at the background of these three uh, individuals. So Joseph Priestley was a English clergyman or a chemist and uh, Carl Scheele was from Sweden and Antoine Lavoisier was from France. And the person who really discovered oxygen first was actually Carl Scheele, but he did not publish his papers right away. He was like one of our uh, fellows or postgraduates who does all the science but has no interest in writing them up. On the other hand, Joseph Priestley discovered oxygen a few years after Carl Scheele, but he was very meticulous and wrote all his three papers right away in 1774. And for that reason, he gets the credit in all our books to be the discoverer of oxygen, although the person who really should get the credit is Carl Scheele. So this goes to show that unless you publish, you perish. And it's a lesson to all of us who tend to be very enthusiastic till we publish our abstracts at various organization meetings. And then when it comes to writing, we tend to slack off and not really complete our job. On the other hand, here is Antoine Lavoisier. He was the real brain behind all this. He named the substance oxygen and realized its role in combustion and respiration. But unfortunately, he messed with tobacco and he was eventually beheaded for diluting tobacco in 1794. So again, two lessons from this particular story. One, publish your papers right away, don't wait. And two, don't mess with tobacco. So nothing has changed in close to 300 years. Everything is still the same. Okay, moving ahead. Why do we use oxygen so much? I mean, each one of us, every day in the NICU, we use plenty of oxygen. So what are the goals of oxygen therapy in hypoxemic respiratory failure. Okay, the number one is to meet tissue oxygen demand because unless you have oxygen, you really can't meet tissue demand. And it's not just the SpO2 or PaO2 that matters, it's both flow and oxygen content. So you need to have adequate blood flow to your tissue and there should be adequate oxygen content. And the content of oxygen is determined by two factors, hemoglobin and oxygen saturation in the blood. So those are the three factors that determine tissue oxygen, tissue oxygen demand is met by these three factors. Next, 
The reason why we need oxygen is because we need to avoid anaerobic metabolism. Anaerobic metabolism leads to lactic acidosis and is very ineffective and inefficient. Number three, in babies especially, the pulmonary circulation is prone for hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and not giving enough oxygen results in more severe hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and that in turn leads to increased or exacerbation of pulmonary hypertension. And so that's something that we need to avoid as well. Moving along, um, we deal with babies. If you don't give them enough oxygen, they don't go well. And as we know quite well, babies with bronchopulmonary dysplasia or BPD, if you don't give them enough oxygen and if they're hypoxemic, their rate of growth is really impaired and giving them adequate oxygen is really important to maintain and sustain growth. And finally, although we use oxygen, we need to minimize oxidative stress. Both hypoxemia and hyperoxemia can cause oxidative stress. And we need to make sure we strike the right balance while managing these babies, which is easier said than done. So to the whole world, which uses oxygen, we pediatricians and neonatologists were the first people to show them the perils of excessive oxygen. And uh, for those of you who trained who are around my age and trained way back in the 80s and 90s, it was not uncommon to have bassinets like this with oxygen being connected over here, 100% pure O2. And many of these babies hardly got any oxygen saturations measured and would occasionally do a blood gas once in a while and then adjust their oxygen content. And this particular approach in the 1940s and 50s in the US led to an epidemic of retrolental fibroplasia, currently known as retinopathy of prematurity, and this led to blindness. So this particular theory that pediatricians commonly think of and neonatologists commonly think of, that if a little is great, then a lot is better, then way too much is just about right. This principle does not work well with oxygen. And excess oxygen clearly caused quite a few cases of blindness. And it's really unfortunate that even to this day, there are many centers in the world where oxygen is used very liberally in preterm infants resulting in retrolental fibroplasia or retinopathy of prematurity. So with this background, um, to, to, in order to determine what is the optimal target SpO2 for preterm neonates that would result in reduced death or neurodisability, there was a fairly large group of studies done. And this, is, this group of studies, as many of you know, is called Neopron. Quite a few of you participated in these studies and to this day, this happens to be one of the largest group of studies that has involved dealing with extremely preterm infants, close to 5,000 infants. So this study addressed the really important question, what is the optimal target SpO2 for preterm neonates that would result in reduced death or neurodisability? And these studies were done in US in the support trial, in Canada and some other countries in the CART trial, and then in Australia, New Zealand, and UK as part of the BOOST two trials. These papers were published approximately a decade ago in very reputed journals. And the randomization in this particular trial was between two arms, SATs of 85 to 89% target, and SATs of 91 to 95% target. And this combined outcome of death or neurodisability happened in 53.5% of infants in the lower target group and 51.6% of infants in the higher target group, no significant difference whatsoever. But interestingly, the secondary outcomes were quite different. For example, in the lower target group, there was an increased incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis. There was higher mortality. This became a big issue. And there was also a need, higher need for PDA surgical ligation. On the other hand, in the high oxygen group, as expected, there was a higher incidence of ROP, ROP, although untreatment for ROP, although there was no change in the incidence of blindness in follow-up. Interestingly, there was also an increased need for supplemental oxygen at 36 weeks postmenstrual age, mainly because these babies got more oxygen during earlier course in their care, in their NICU life. So with these results, the choice became really tough. Do you choose ROP and visual disturbances or do you choose death? And as most of us would do, we wanted to prevent death at all costs. So many agencies, many NICUs around the, around the world decided to go up on their oxygen saturation targets from 
high 80s to low 90s to completely in the low 90 range, usually between 91 and 95 percent oxygen saturation range. So this is the conclusion of the ASCII paper, which is the individual patient data meta-analysis, which basically concluded that the primary composite outcome of death or major disability at corrected age 18 to 24 months was similar, but a lower SpO2 target range was associated with higher risk of death and necrotizing colitis, necrotizing enterocolitis, but a lower risk of retinopathy of prematurity treatment. And this was the eventual conclusion of these meta-analysis. So, so although the incidence of pulmonary hypertension was not evaluated or reported in, in any of the NeoProm trials, subsequent to change in saturation guidelines, papers have come out both from Australia, Canada, and US, and they have reported either changes in the incidence of pulmonary hypertension and also changes in the incidence of ROP. So for example, in this particular paper from Canada, when the saturation target was changed from 88 to 92 percent to 90 to 95 percent, they noticed that the cumulative incidence of pulmonary hypertension by echo became, became less common. In other words, here is the blue line showing the incidence of pulmonary hypertension when the target oxidation target, target was 88 to 92 percent. On the other hand, when the target was increased to 90 to 95, you saw a reduction in the incidence of pulmonary hypertension. On the other hand, there was a non-significant decrease in the incidence of death, an almost significant increase in the incidence of ROP, and a slight decrease, although non-significant, in, de in the incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis. So the findings in this particular center did follow the general findings in the NeoProm trials. So why do we see such changes in pulmonary hypertension and retinopathy of prematurity? This whole process is determined when all of us are or in our fetal stage, because vascular reactivity to different levels of oxygen is determined when we are in our fetal stage. For example, here is a classic study done by Peters and colleagues way back in 1979, where they modified the level of oxygen in the perfusing blood in the fetal lamp, and then looked at various circulations to see what changes would occur in the circulation to various organs. For example, this nice red vertical bar here represents normal oxygen content in a fetal lamb. If you decrease this oxygen content down, then the ox blood flow to the brainstem, the myocardium, and the adrenals increases. On the other hand, if you decrease the blood flow to decrease oxygen content, there's initially no change, but subsequently a drop in flow to kidney and intestines. This is really important because remember I told you that necrotizing enterocolitis is, com is more common with low oxygen saturation. That's possibly secondary to the fact that gut circulation tends to decrease with lower oxygen concentrations. On the other hand, lung behaves in a different fashion. In the fetal lung, there is less pulmonary blood flow. And if you increase the oxygen content of blood, then obviously you see pulmonary vasodilation. And this is typically what happens when the, once the fetus is born. On the other hand, the placental circulation, the umbilical flow going into the placenta does not really change much with change in oxygen concentration. And this tends to remain flat. And this is a really important finding as well. So what this goes to show is that the reactivity of blood vessels is dependent on the importance of these organs during fetal life. For example, the heart, adrenals, and the brain are considered to be the so-called non-negotiable or essential organs. And in these particular organs, reducing oxygen content leads to a compensatory increase in blood flow so that at least during the initial periods of hypoxemia, the oxygen delivery to these essential organs is maintained. This is really important because a common question many of us had when we entered neonatology was that how come a fetus stays inside the mom's uterus and saturates in the 50s to 60s and is perfectly fine, is not having any acidosis and keeps on growing phenomenally well. But on the other hand, the same baby, if the fetus is born and you have a 23 weeker in the NICU, that baby can tolerate any SATs below 89%. Why does this happen? The reason for this is very simple. It's the fact that the placental blood flow from the fetus, the umbilical circulation, is not dependent on PaO2, 
And so the placenta being the site of gas exchange during fetal life can have can continue to supply oxygen irrespective of the PaO2 in the baby. On the other hand, once the fetus is born and this baby is in an extra uterine environment, the lung becomes the source of gas exchange and reducing PaO2 reduces circulation to the lung due to hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And for this reason, you and I and anybody in outside the uterus cannot tolerate low oxygen levels because we tend to go into hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So let's look at the brain circulation in greater detail because this is really important for those of us who deal with uh, babies with hypoxic, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So as I mentioned previously, if this number, this vertical line here represents around 12 ml per deciliter of arterial oxygen content. So when the oxygen content in the blood goes below this particular number, there is an increase in the amount of blood going to the brain. In other words, the brain compensates for hypoxemia by increasing blood flow. So what you see in the brain is hypoxic, hypoxic cerebral vasodilation. This phenomenon is slightly depressed in babies that have gone through asphyxia. This is actually studies in lamb again. In addition, there is increased oxygen extraction as arterial oxygen content goes down. So in other words, in the brain, if you reduce the arterial oxygen content, there is increase in blood flow to the brain. On the other hand, if you increase, if you cause hyperoxemia, then there is a reduction in the blood flow going into the brain, and that's really important as well. Why is this important? Here is a really nice small study done by Vishal Kapadia and colleagues in Dallas in the US, where they looked at babies who were being considered for hypothermia. And they measured the first PaO2 in these babies as soon as these babies came to the NICU. And they ran our classified babies into different categories based on the first PaO2. And then they went ahead and looked at these babies and evaluated the incidence of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And what they noticed was that if the baby in on the first arterial blood gas in these babies had normal PaO2 values, then the risk of HIE was much lower, 22% to 27%. On the other hand, if the first PaO2 value measured in these babies following perinatal distress was higher than 115 millimeters of mercury, then the risk of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy was higher. And especially if the levels were very high, the risk was even more higher. So this goes to show that there is an association between perinatal asphyxia and postnatal hyperoxia, which increases the incidence of HIE. This could just be an association. We can't really imply causation, but it clearly shows that we should be careful when, and we should avoid extremely high oxygen concentrations in the immediate postnatal period, especially if the baby had asphyxia and required resuscitation. So again, when you look at the pulmonary circulation, the exact opposite happens. When the PaO2 falls below 50 millimeters of mercury, you see a reduction in pulmonary blood flow in lungs, and this is the phenomenon of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So this goes to show that every single day that you and I work in the NICU, we are performing a delicate balance between hypoxemia and hyperoxemia. Hypoxemia causes decreased pulmonary blood flow, increases the incidence of pulmonary hypertension, decreases splanchnic blood flow, increases the incidence of necrotizing enterocolitis in preterm babies, and can also result in death. So the lung is very sensitive to inspired oxygen or FiO2. On the other hand, if the PaO2 is high, it reduces cerebral blood flow and also causes retinal vasoconstriction and increases the incidence of retinopathy of prematurity. And this is something for us to remember. And as far as the brain and the eye are concerned, the, PO, the O2 that really matters is the arterial PaO2 because that's what supplies these tissues. So there's a complete discrepancy between what the lung sees, how the lung reacts to oxygen, and how the brain reacts to oxygen. And again, the inspired oxygen or FiO2 is really important in the lung, whereas PaO2 or arterial oxygenation is really important for the brain and the eye. Okay, so moving on to term babies. Uh, we've heard about preterm babies. Let's see what guidelines we have for term babies. And each one of us takes care of many babies with pulmonary hypertension. 
So what guidelines do we get from national and international organizations for managing oxygenation in babies with pulmonary hypertension? The American Heart Association and the American Thoracic Society state that the FiO2 of more than 0.6 or 60% oxygen may be ineffective owing to extra pulmonary shunting and may aggravate lung injury. They also recommend that oxygen be given for infants when the SpO2 is below 92%, especially for those with associated respiratory disease. So in other words, they want you to avoid extreme alveolar hypoxia and limit FiO2 to less than 0.6 if possible, and also avoid oxygen saturations below 92% if you have lung disease. The European Pulmonary Vascular Disease Network is a lot more specific. It clearly states that pre-rectal SpO2, which is preferably the right hand or right arm, pulse oximetry should be maintained between 91 and 95% when PPHN is suspected or established. There are various guidelines for congenital diaphragmatic hernia. They vary from different countries. And in general, they also recommend saturations in the low 90s although they do tolerate saturations in the high 80s for the first few hours after life. And uh, in adults, if you develop ARDS, the current recommendations in the US are to maintain a PaO2 between 55 and 80 millimeters of mercury and SATs between 88 to 95. The sad part with all the term baby recommendations is that there is no clinical evidence for any of these guidelines from randomized control trials. To my knowledge, there is not a single randomized control trial in the world that had looked at, looked at term neonates with pulmonary hypertension and evaluated oxygen saturations to come up with these guidelines. So all these guidelines are based on either animal data or data from older children and extrapolated for term infants. So what is this phenomenon of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction? Why is this so important? As many of us have gone through COVID, many of us have suffered from COVID, and developing respiratory distress is not uncommon with COVID with requiring oxygen. Say for example, if this particular individual develops a low bar pneumonia with any kind of infection, then there is no point in wasting blood flow to this segment of the lung. And for that reason, the blood vessels supplying this diseased alveolus tend to constrict, limiting blood flow to a diseased alveolus, thereby enhancing ventilation perfusion matching. And this is the basis for hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And this has been conserved over millions of years across many different species. It's a very powerful mechanism. So way back in 1966, before many of us were born, uh, Abe Rudolph at, in San Francisco did a simple experiment in newborn calves and showed that when the PaO2 goes below 50 millimeters of mercury, then there is an abrupt increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. And this phenomenon is what we call as hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. He went on to, based on, then he showed that if the PaO2 is maintained between 55 and 80 millimeters of mercury, similar to what is recommended for adult respiratory distress or acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS in adults, there is profound pulmonary vasodilation with low PVR. Excuse me. On the other hand, if the PaO2 exceeds 100, there is no further improvement in pulmonary vascular resistance. In other words, hypoxia causes pulmonary vasoconstriction, normoxia causes pulmonary vasodilation, but hyperoxia does not cause additional vasodilation. And in fact, there is clear evidence from animal studies that hyperoxia, even for a short period of time, as short as 30 minutes, is adequate to cause significant damage through oxidant injury. So here are some slides from the lungs of newborn lambs. And this group of newborn lambs on the top received only around 21 to 40% oxygen, whereas the newborn lambs from the bottom received 100% O2. And here is a pulmonary artery from uh, airway and pulmonary artery from these lambs. And as you can see here, they do not light up well. Any red stain here is superoxide anions. Any green stain here is hydrogen peroxide. On the other hand, if you give 100% O2, you see that the pulmonary artery really lights up like crazy. And so does the, with both superoxide anions and with hydrogen peroxide, clearly indicating that hyperoxic exposure with 200% oxygen increases free radical injury in the lung and especially in the pulmonary artery. So the graph I showed you from Dr. Rudolph's studies is not a static number. In other words, 
every single baby does not go into hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and the PaO2 falls below 45. This particular phenomenon is also dependent on acidosis. Here you can see that when the pH is 7.1 and if the lamp is acidotic, then the change point, the point at which hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction ensues is around 55 millimeters of mercury. On the other hand, when the pH is better at 7.2, the number is lower and similarly 7.3 and 7.4. So this goes to show that if you maintain pH normally, babies can tolerate slightly more severe degree of hypo hypoxia compared to when there is acidosis. So acidosis exacerbates hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So while managing babies with pulmonary hypertension, it's really prudent to avoid pH below 725 because this acidosis, whether it's respiratory or metabolic, tends to make the pulmonary arteries more twitchy and more sensitive to hypoxia and tends to exacerbate hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So it's really important to try to maintain pH above 7.25 while managing babies with pulmonary hypertension. So we don't use PaO2 all the time in the NICU. We tend to prefer to use pulse oximetry, especially predictal pulse oximetry. And for that reason, we did a series of studies in different kinds of lamps. Lamps with pulmonary hypertension induced by antenatal ductal ligation, lamps with asphyxia and meconium aspiration syndrome, or just plain newborn lamps without any lung disease. And irrespective of the model we chose, it was very clear that when you maintain the pulse oximetry saturations, especially in the preductal region, between 90 and 97%, the pulmonary vascular resistance was low, suggesting that maintaining SATs in the low to mid 90s is what really causes optimal pulmonary vasodilation in newborn animal models with pulmonary hypertension. So how do we really practically implement this in the NICU? So I'm a huge movie of the movie Cars. I hope many of you have watched this movie as well. And if you think of a baby as a car and the journey in the NICU starts from over here and ends over here, this particular lane is the oxygen saturation target. So it's really important to realize that if you make the lane very narrow, let's say you want the nurses to maintain oxygen saturation between 92 and 95% in a really narrow range, it's very difficult to stay within the lane. On the other hand, if a wider range is given, say 90 to 98%, it's much more easier to stay within target. So the wider the lane, the more easier for it for the car to maintain within the target. So we know, especially those of us who drive home post-call, we know fully well that we tend to skip these lines and drive on either side of the lane. And for this reason, there are these two things at the end of the road, known as the rumble strips or the alarm limits. So these are strips at the end of the road, which make a real loud noise when you drive over them. And that alerts you to come back into the normal lane. And these rumble strips are the alarm limits when you maintain pulse oximetry. And these alarm limits are very important so that the babies can maintain within their saturation target range. And setting these alarm limits appropriately is key to managing normoxia in babies. So we briefly talked about the fact that maintaining SAT between 90 to 97 or 98% is really important. And we did a few more studies to look at the importance of FiO2 while managing these babies. So here is a group of studies also done in lamps with meconium aspiration where Dr. Munman Rawat from Buffalo randomized lamps to either receive oxygen to target SATs between 85 to 89, 90 to 94, 95 to 99, or give them a fixed FiO2 of 1.0 or 100% oxygen continuously. And what she noted was that if you give them SATs, if you target SATs below 90, the pulmonary blood flow is very low, and this is not good. On the other hand, when you target SATs in the mid low 90s, the pulmonary blood flow improves dramatically and the requirement of oxygen actually goes down and the PaO2 is within normal target. On the other hand, in this particular study, when you, when you target SATs in the higher 90s, then although there was not a huge difference in PaO2, some of these lamps required much higher FiO2 and this higher FiO2 resulted in much better pulmonary blood flow. But the real important lesson in this study is that when you give inspired oxygen of 100% continuously, in fact, although your PaO2 is considerably higher, there is a drop in pulmonary blood flow. And so 
extreme hyperoxia is not good for the lung and can cause pulmonary vasoconstriction. So again, maintaining SATs in the 80s is not a good idea. Maintaining SATs in the low 90s works quite well. And maintaining SATs in the slightly higher range in the high 90s tends to cause for a little further pulmonary vasodilation, but maintaining SATs in the 100% range with extreme hyperoxia tends to actually cause reduction in pulmonary blood flow and should be avoided. So these two oxygen saturation ranges are okay, but giving slightly more FiO2 in this particular case tends to improve pulmonary blood flow. So FiO2 is as important as PaO2 while managing babies with pulmonary hypertension. So why is this so important? If you think of this to be the heart, and this is the pulmonary artery, and here is the alveolus, and here is the pulmonary vein, the vessel in the body that senses oxygen and causes pulmonary vasoconstriction is the precapillary pulmonary arteriole, this particular vessel that you see over here. So what influences oxygen level at this particular level? The number one factor is alveolar PaO2 or uppercase O2. This is the main determinant of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So this is in turn determined by FiO2, and for this reason, providing adequate FiO2 is important while managing babies with pulmonary hypertension. The second factor is pulmonary arterial PVO2 or the oxygenation within the pulmonary artery. And this number is mainly determined by the mixed venous O2. And that's really important as well. So these are the two factors that determine pulmonary vascular resistance. But since we can't measure alveolar PaO2 on a continuous basis, we tend to use the surrogate of arterial oxygenation, especially preductal oxygenation, to determine pulmonary vascular resistance. So getting back to our guidelines that were recommended earlier, the ATS and AHA guidelines indicate that extreme hyperoxia of FiO2 of more than 0.6 should be avoided. Why is this important? It's important to realize that Oxygen toxicity in the lung is also mediated by inspired oxygen. So when your inspired oxygen concentration goes above 60%, it tends to cause more lung damage than when the inspired oxygen is less than 60%. So the lower the FiO2, the better it is for the lung, and higher the FiO2, the more damaging it is. And 60% O2 appears to be a fairly important cutoff, and hence the term that I commonly use in the NICU, sexagen T4-BA, which is fear of the number 60. Because once you exceed this number, there appears to be some more concerns with the lung. So to give you an example, let's say you have a baby with congenital diaphragmatic hernia, and the baby is in the unit, and you measure the preductal pulse oximetry, it's 85%. You measure postductal, it's 70%. The baby is on 30% O2. And then you check a targeted neonatal echo on this baby, and you find that the baby is in rip-roaring pulmonary hypertension on the echo. What do you do with this kid? Do you want to leave the baby alone or do you want to increase the inspired oxygen to around 50% so that the preductal oxygen saturation goes to around 95% from 85% and the postductal goes up to 80%? So in this particular case, the benefit of higher FiO2 going from 30 to 50% and increase in SpO2 from 85 to 95% outweighs the risk of oxygen toxicity. So going a slightly higher on this FiO2 to 50% is probably the right thing to do. On the other hand, let's say you have the same baby with diaphragmatic hernia, saturating the same thing, 85% or 85% preductal and 70% postductal, but this baby is in 80% inspired oxygen already, and baby still has findings of acute pulmonary hypertension on echo. In this baby, you're already subjecting the lung to oxygen toxicity. Going up from 80 to 100%, to achieve a marginal increase in saturations is probably not really a huge benefit. And so in this baby, the risk of oxygen toxicity, because the FiO2 is so high, outweighs the subtle benefit you get from higher FiO2 and SpO2. And for this reason, it's probably okay to leave this child alone at 80% oxygen with 85% critical sets. So there is no clear-cut guideline for SpO2 in every single baby. Each baby should be considered a, his or her own individual target range. And that target range is dependent on baby's pH, baby's lung condition, FiO2, and echocardiogram showing evidence of pulmonary hypertension. 
So you have to look at each baby individually and determine the appropriate oxygen target for that particular infant. Okay, enough about oxygen, and let's move on to inhaled nitric oxide. As many of you remember, inhaled nitric oxide is considered as the perfect pulmonary vasodilator, and for that reason, many of us use it a lot in the NICU. So just like we talked about the origin of uh, oxygen and discovery of oxygen, let's look into the discovery of inhaled nitric oxide. This is Alfred Nobel, and as many of you know, he made most of his money by making dynamite using nitroglycerin. So in 1860s, workers at the dynamite factories where Alfred Nobel was making dynamite observed two interesting phenomena. One, healthy individuals who came to work started experiencing headaches because they used to inhale nitroglycerin and that used to cause vasodilation in the brain and that would cause them to have headaches. On the other hand, sedentary individuals with ischemic heart disease tended to do well when they were at the factory, but when they came home on weekends, they started suffering from chest pains and fatigue because they were being deprived of inhaled nitroglycerin for helping them maintain coronary vasodilation. Move on, go further for around 150 years, and then Robert, Robert Furchback, an eminent scientist in Brooklyn, found that when he tested blood vessels in isolated tissue bags, one group of blood vessels that were meticulously dissected tended to behave differently from blood vessels that were not meticulously dissected where endothelium was destroyed. In other words, if you gave acetylcholine to a vessel with intact endothelium, this blood vessel relaxed. On the other hand, when the acetylcholine was given to a blood vessel without intact endothelium, it acted on smooth muscle cells, causing vasoconstriction instead. And he labeled this substance as endothelium-derived relaxing factor, which now we know to be nitric oxide. So if the endothelium is intact, acetylcholine acts on endothelial nitric oxide synthase to release nitric oxide, which further produces cyclic GMP and relaxes smooth muscle cell. On the other hand, if there is no endothelium and you give acetylcholine directly, that acts on the smooth muscle cell and tends to cause vasoconstriction. So these three scientists, Robert Furchgaard, Louis Ignaro, and Ferid Murad, went on to win the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1998. And this really completes a very interesting cycle where nitroglycerin was used to make dynamite by Alfred Nobel, and nitroglycerin later became a, a therapeutic agent for ischemic heart disease. Subsequently, endothelium derived relaxing factor was discovered, and then eventually these three individuals got the Nobel Prize. So this is like the cycle of nitric oxide discovery. It starts with Nobel and ends with the Nobel Prize as well. So what is nitric oxide approved for? Way back in 1980, 1999, inhaled nitric oxide got approved for near-term and term infants greater than 34 weeks of gestation with hypoxemic respiratory failure with clinical or echo evidence of pulmonary hypertension to improve oxygenation and reduce the need for ECMO. It's interesting that it has been almost 23, 24 years since this approval has happened. And to this day, this is the only indication for inhaled nitric oxide in human beings. Inhaled nitric oxide is not approved in preterm infants. It's not approved in kids beyond the neonatal period. It's not approved in adults, although MICUs and PICUs use a lot of inhaled nitric oxide now. So why is inhaled nitric oxide considered a, an ideal pulmonary vasodilator? That's because just like oxygen, inhaled nitric oxide enters only ventilated alveoli. It does not enter non-ventilated alveoli. And for this reason, it tends to open up blood vessels adjacent to your ventilated alveolus, thereby increasing ventilation perfusion matching. And so for this reason, when you use inhaled nitric oxide, even in babies that do not have any echocardiographic evidence of pulmonary hypertension, you may see a subtle increase in oxygenation. And this subtle increase is due to optimization of ventilation and perfusion. And this effect of nitric oxide is called as the microselective effect. Once inhaled NO is absorbed into the system, into the circulation, it, it's inactivated by hemoglobin and forming methemoglobin. And for this reason, for the most part, there is no systemic vasodilation or systemic hypotension with the use of inhaled nitric oxide in babies. So when do you initiate inhaled nitric oxide? 
I have two rules for this regard. One is the rule of 20-20-20, where you initiate inhaled nitric oxide in a dose of 20 parts per million, when the oxygenation index is approximately around 20, and if complete response is defined as an increase in PAO2 to FIO2 ratio of around 20 millimeters of mercury. On the other hand, it's really important to wean oxygen, wean nitric oxide as well. So when the baby is, the, when you start nitric oxide and you wait for 30 minutes, and then you check the inspired oxygen level. If the inspired oxygen concentration is less than 60%, and if the baby is saturating well with the predictable sat of more than 90%, it's time to start weaning nitric oxide. There is no point in leaving babies continuously on nitric oxide for long periods of time. If the baby is responding, it's really important to wean the nitric oxide and then ultimately discontinue nitric oxide. But it's important to wean oxygen first, bring the FiO2 below 0.6 or below 60% oxygen before you touch nitric oxide because hyperoxia is more harmful than a normal dose of 20 parts per million of nitric oxide. And the combination of hyperoxia and nitric oxide is not good, as you will see in the next sub subsequent slides. Okay, one more thing to remember, when you're using nitric oxide in babies with pulmonary hypertension, you got to figure out if the baby is suffering from pulmonary hypertension due to lung disease, parenchymal lung disease, pulmonary hypoplasia, or idiopathic or black lung PPHN. If the baby is having PPHN secondary to parenchymal lung disease, such as meconium aspiration syndrome, or respiratory distress syndrome, or pneumonia, in these patients, it's better to give a dose of surfactant first, recruit the lung, and then give inhaled nitric oxide. This was proven in a randomized trial by Gonzalez and colleagues in Chile, where they went ahead and gave a few babies surfactant and then gave inhaled nitric oxide. And in the control arm, they did not use surfactant and just gave inhaled nitric oxide. Although both arms got better with a drop in oxygenation index, the degree of reduction in oxygenation index was much more pronounced in babies that got surfactant and inhaled nitric oxide compared to babies that got inhaled nitric oxide alone. So this goes to show that when you have asymmetric lung disease due to parenchymal lung disease, there, is, there are some collapsed alveoli and there are some over-distended alveoli. The collapsed alveoli cause hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and increased pulmonary vascular resistance. These over-distended alveoli directly compress upon pulmonary vessels, alveolar pulmonary vessels, and increase pulmonary vascular resistance, and this causes pulmonary hypertension. Then if you give inhaled nitric oxide without recruiting the lung, inhaled nitric oxide cannot enter the collapsed alveolus. It only goes to the over-distended alveolus, but it can be very effective in causing pulmonary vasodilation because these blood vessels are already compressed by the over-distended lung. On the other hand, if you give surfactant first, recruit the lung, get uniform lung dilation, and then give nitric oxide, nitric oxide can reach all the alveoli now and cause uniform pulmonary vasodilation, thereby reducing pulmonary vascular resistance. So if you have a baby with parenchymal lung disease, usually if the FiO2 is more than 40% and if there is evidence of lung disease on X-ray, I prefer to use a dose of surfactant. And in many cases, that medication is enough to improve oxygenation and you hardly ever have to use inhaled nitric oxide in some of these babies. So using surfactant first before giving inhaled nitric oxide is really important when you manage patients with pulmonary hypertension secondary to parenchymal lung disease. So here is an example. Uh, here is a baby who is having, who is poorly recruited, has not received surfactant and was receiving inhaled nitric oxide with very poor improvement in PaO2 and subsequently this baby got put on an oscillator with higher mean air pressure, and a dose of surfactant was given. That resulted in much better improvement in alveolar expansion, and nitric oxide was much more effective, and the baby could be in FiO2 quite well. So giving NO without recruitment of the lung when the lung is like this is ineffective because NO cannot reach its target organ, which is the pulmonary blood vessel. Unless you recruit the lung, open up the lung, there is no point in giving ox nitric oxide because nitric oxide cannot reach the alveolus on the pulmonary blood vessels. So there is one particular condition that you should be very uh, cognizant about, which is a contraindication for using inhaled nitric oxide, and that's left ventricular dysfunction. Left ventricular dysfunction is fairly common in asphyxia, whether you're using whole body hypothermia or not. It's common in diaphragmatic hernia. It's also common in sepsis. In these conditions, when the left ventricular dysfunction is present, there is elevated left atrial pressure, 
which in turn leads to pulmonary venous hypertension and pulmonary edema. In this case, if you go ahead and use inhaled nitric oxide, it's almost like having a toilet where the outflow is obstructed, which is left particular dysfunction. And if you keep on flushing this toilet, which is the equivalent of giving nitric oxide, you worsen pulmonary edema and cause MS. On the other hand, the right treatment for this approach is a drug such as milinone, which should be given to improve left ventricular function first. And once the left ventricular function improves and pulmonary edema is resolved, then subsequently you can go ahead and use inhaled nitric oxide. So inhaled nitric oxide should be avoided in the presence of active LV dysfunction, especially if there is poor ejection fraction, pulmonary edema, and often many of these babies have a left to right shunt across the oval foramen, although they have pulmonary hypertension. So if you have a combination of these three things, poor ejection fraction, a left to right shunt across the oval foramen, and pulmonary edema, you should suspect the presence of LV dysfunction and avoid inhaled nitric oxide in these babies until their LV function is improved. However, it's important to realize that milirone should be used carefully, especially in babies with hypothermia, if they have kidney disease, because high creatinine and poor renal function tends to exacerbate side effects of milirone, especially systemic hypotension. Okay, in the last five minutes, let's look at the interaction between inhaled NO and oxygen. So as I mentioned to you earlier, NO is very effective in causing pulmonary vasodilation. The half-life of endogenous NO is mainly determined by local concentration of superoxide anions. So superoxide anions combine avidly with nitric oxide to form a toxic substance called as peroxynitrite, which is the devil here. So this peroxynitrite can be formed when you combine nitric oxide with high concentrations of oxygen. So if you use optimal oxygen levels and inhale nitric oxide, you tend to cause pulmonary vasodilation. On the other hand, when you use high concentrations of oxygen, especially above 60%, this can result in the formation of superoxide anions, which in turn can combine with nitric oxide to form peroxynitrate, which is a very powerful vasoconstrictor. And this is something to remember in while managing babies with PPHM. So to show evidence of increased peroxynitrate formation, we did a study where we looked at lamps with pulmonary hypertension and we ventilated them with 100% O2 for 24 hours. No nitric oxide, just 100% oxygen for 24 hours. And this green substance, green dye stain here, represents 3-nitrotyrosine, which is peroxynitrite. So as you can see here, the pulmonary artery lights up with 3-nitrotyrosine or peroxynitrite when you just give oxygen. We then went ahead and gave 100% O2 along with 20 parts per million of inhaled nitric oxide. And then we saw that the amount of peroxynitrate formation skyrocketed the alveolus and the pulmonary artery lighted up like crazy and they used both 100% oxygen and nitric oxide. So this combination given for 24 hours can result in significant oxidant injury with peroxynitrite formation. On the other hand, when we used a dose of recombinant human superoxide dismutase, which is not approved by FDA, but, and so we gave one dose of this to these lamps. As you can see here, removing superoxide anions by using superoxide dismutase completely eliminated peroxynitrite in the lungs, both in the pulmonary artery and also in the alveolus. But since we don't have access to this compound, what we can really do is to reduce the FiO2 below 60% and then be in nitric oxide. So maintaining target TiO2 between 50 and 80 millimeters of mercury and weaning FiO2 to bring FiO2 below 0.6 also resulted in substantial reduction in formation of, so, formation of peroxynitrite. So ventilating with 100% O2 and oxygen and 20 parts per million of inhaled nitric oxide continuously for long periods of time is not a good idea. On the other hand, weaning inspired oxygen judiciously to maintain a target PaO2 and trying to maintain inspired oxygen below 60% is really key when managing babies with pulmonary hypertension to limit the effect of peroxynitrate-mediated pulmonary vasoconstriction. So in fact, there's a study from Italy where Gitto and colleagues have randomized babies to either receive 80% O2 and nitric oxide or 45% O2 and nitric oxide. And what they showed was that when you measure serum TNF alpha to look at pro-inflammatory cascade, a combination of high oxygen and nitric oxide is pro-inflammatory. On the other hand, a combination of low oxygen concentrations and nitric oxide is anti-inflammatory. So the behavior of nitric oxide 
as far as inflammation in the body is concerned, is dependent on the concentration of oxygen. High oxygen causes more damage, when low oxygen actually causes more benefit when combined with nitric oxide. So we also have shown that if you resuscitate babies with 100% O2, subsequent response to inhaled nitric oxide is reduced. On the other hand, if you resuscitate babies with either 21% O2 or 50% O2, the response to inhaled nitric oxide is maintained. So babies that require high amounts of oxygen in the delivery room may actually produce free radical injury. This is supraxial anions in the pulmonary artery of a lamp that was resuscitated with 100% oxygen just for 30 minutes. And this subsequently can impair relaxation response to inhaled nitric oxide. So it's really important when you go to deliveries with babies with diaphragmatic hernia or meconium aspiration, start resuscitating with an FiO2 of 0.21 or 21% oxygen and slowly go up on FiO2 as needed in these cases. Okay, that brings us to the last section. These are slides from Julie Oi, as you can see here. It's the hell component of this combination. And as Julie has very beautifully pointed out here, there are several things that we do in the NICU that are carcinogenic. Oxygen, phototherapy, radiation, drugs, all of these things tend to be carcinogenic. But what she showed in this cohort was that among babies admitted to NICUs and discharged from NICUs who have stayed alive for more than one month, the incidence of cancer is not insignificant. And the factors that really influence the severity or incidence of cancer in these patients are listed below. Gestation, birth weight, nitric oxide, and oxygen. And of all these factors, nitric oxide exposure was associated with the highest adjusted odds ratio of 16 with a 95% confidence interval of 6.9 to 36.8. In other words, babies who are exposed to nitric oxide in their NICU were at risk for developing cancer later on in life. And if you can see her numbers here, if you expose every, for every thousand babies exposed to inhaled nitric oxide, 11 of them go on to develop cancer in this particular cohort, which is an alarming number. So every time you start inhaled nitric oxide in the NICU, just think of the fact that 13 out of the thousand babies that you start inhaled nitric oxide might be developing cancer in their childhood, and that's an alarming statistics. She also went on to show that this type of cancers include both blood cancers and solid tumor cancers. And so all of these can be associated with inhaled nitric oxide. This is purely an association and we really do not know if it's a causation. And I know Julie is conducting more studies to look at this in greater detail. So to conclude, nitric oxide and oxygen are great agents in the short term. Just like in any marriage, honeymoon is a bliss. In the short term, both nitric oxide and oxygen cause pulmonary vasodilation and improvement in oxygenation. On the other hand, excess of oxygen can generate superoxide anions and form toxic peroxynitrite. And ex ex excess inhaled nitric oxide can cause nitrogen dioxide production, the hemoglobinemia. And as we have seen just now, there might be an association with cancer as well. So the, the one thing that I wanted to remember from this talk is that we in oxygen first down to 60% when you have babies on a combination of NO and high oxygen concentration. And then we inhale nitric oxide. Avoid leaving patients on 100% O2 and nitric oxide for long periods of time. If on supplemental oxygen, avoid pulse ox between 19 and 100% because we do not know all the effects of oxygen and nitric oxide in the long term. So to conclude, if you walk into your NICU and if there's a baby like this who is on supplemental oxygen, they're saturating 100%, do something about it. Wean the FiO2. Don't let babies sit in 99% or 100% oxygen when they are on supplemental oxygen. This is because when you have a baby with a PaO2, with an SpO2 of 100%, on down supplemental oxygen, you never know if the PaO2 is 90 or the PaO2 is 350. And having a very high PaO2 tends to cause damage to the mitochondria and can really result in long-term problems. So that's almost like trying a mitochondria in high O2. So avoid SpO2 of 98, 99, and 100% when these babies are on supplemental oxygen. I thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm sorry I took a little longer than I was expecting, but we have a few minutes for questions, and I can also check the chat to see if you had any other thoughts. Thank you, such an amazing slides as usual. You take the prize for best looking slides ever. Um, all right, while they're getting ready for questions, um, if anyone wants to ask a question, maybe just unmute yourself, unmask yourself and ask uh, Satyan face-to-face, -face, or if you're shy, 
type it onto the chat pane. Um, well, I also want to thank okay. Helen for putting the uh, link to Lavois. He's really such an important character and has done so many things and he's often forgotten. The fact that all of you mentioned Joseph Priestley and none of you mentioned either Lavois or Carl Steele clearly shows that we tend to forget people who have contributed uh, science and writing papers is important. One more lesson from that. Um, Listen to that, write, write your papers, publish, publish, publish. So Dr. <laughs> Lee from Hunan Children's, I think, has said no, uh, no experience in perioperative, perioperative period for babies with cyanotic congenital heart disease. So that's really a good question. And no experience in post-op of a single ventricle. I don't have any experience in that, Satyan. Would you like to take that one? Sure. Um, post-op cardiac use of nitric oxide is really interesting. And I don't know uh, if Dr. Lee has seen, there's actually a paper that came out yesterday in JAMA talking about the use of nitric oxide during bypass for cardiac surgery uh, in neonates. And they basically have sh shown that you can use nitric oxide during bypass and that can have some beneficial effects. So, so there is very limited data on this particular uh, uh, entity. And uh, uh, I do use quite a bit of NO in the post-operative period in these babies, but I don't think anybody has methodically studied this. And obviously there is no clear cut um, benefit or disadvantage, and hence we don't have an FDA approval for this particular indication. But if you have a baby whose red light ventricle is struggling or failing, and you need to reduce its afterload, you know, it can be a very effective agent and can be used in those particular instances. Uh, our post, our cardiac IC uses a lot of nitric oxide here, in, uh, here at Davis. Uh, Helen actually writes here, uh, Antoine Lavois, that's actually his wife, who's also a chemist who translated and corrected all his papers. As, as usual, the brainy people- oh, the women. I know, the brainy people are the women. We men just get all the credit. Hold this guy up. Uh, Dr. Dr. Sam from Singapore would like to ask a question. Hi, Sam. Uh, excellent uh, lecture, uh, Dr. Satyan. My question is, babies below 28 weeks, we do see now and then pulmonary hypertension complicating the lung disease. They don't improve after giving early surfactant. Can you, you know, what is the role of INO in this unapproved group? That's a great question, uh, Professor Sam. Uh, I was hoping nobody would ask that question because the answer is not a good one. Uh, we have conducted lots and lots of retrospective data analysis, uh, both from Unital Research Network and also our own databases. And as you can rightly uh, imagine, babies who receive inhaled nitric oxide are the sickest babies in the NICU. And it's used as a last ditch desperate measure in these babies. And many of them do show some improvement in oxygenation. But when you look at the long term outcomes, most babies have really bad outcomes. So there is no real improvement in long-term outcomes of the use of inhaled nitric oxide. So there are some papers that have suggested that selective use of inhaled nitric oxide in preterm babies who have prolonged rupture of membranes or possible pulmonary hypoplasia on, on maybe oligohydramnios with evidence of pulmonary hypertension on echocardiogram might be more beneficial and, but that's yet to be shown. Um, Professor John Kinsella from Denver is has collecting data on a prospective registry in preterm infants. And I'm not sure if any of your units are part of that registry. And he's collecting data on preterm infants, checking the, checking the indication for use of nitric oxide, response to nitric oxide, and long-term follow-up. And hopefully when he publishes results from that registry, we'll have much more robust data to address your question. But as of now, it's not approved by FDA. And uh, to my knowledge, no study has shown benefit unless you have pulmonary hyperplasia secondary to prolonged rupture of membranes. And also the importance of rapid weaning of the uh, nitric oxide. Uh, otherwise the lungs get flooded and the baby develops worsening lung situation and pulmonary hemorrhage. That's really true. Uh, it does promote pulmonary vasodilation, 
And there is some concern with early use of inhaled nitric oxide, especially on day one, but the PDA is wide open because once you reduce primary vascular resistance, you tend to cause more fluctuations in cerebral blood flow. And there is a theoretical possibility of increasing the risk of intraventricular hemorrhage in addition to pulmonary hemorrhage. So one has to be careful with using inhaled nitric oxide. You're absolutely right. Uh, I have a question That's from right. Dr. Thank you. Ashok Kumar. Yes. Uh, he's asking, mm -hmm. maintaining SPO to between 90 to 95% is a difficult task. How do you ensure that saturation stay within the target range? Uh, you are absolutely right. As I mentioned, maintaining SATs in a narrow range is difficult. I usually put my alarm limits at 89 and 98%. So there's a fairly wide range and it's much easier to maintain SATs in this range than at a narrow range, such as 90 to 95%. So maintaining oxygen saturation in the low to mid nineties is really efficient. So the SAT limits, alarm limits in my unit, we tend to prefer 89% for the lower alarm limit and 98% for the upper alarm limit so that there's a fairly wide range to maintain saturations. Hopefully in a few years, we will have really good automated FiO2 control on all of our ventilators. And that, that's like driving a car in cruise control with lane um, modification. So since we have those cars already with us, maybe we'll have ventilators that can do this as well pretty soon. So and for Dr. Uh, all of you, yeah, um, before we go on, Sajid, for all of you in the meeting, uh, we do have a talk by Dr. Dargaville from Tasmania and Dr. Deval from Newcastle in August about automated oxygen control and the algorithm that they use in, um, in the ventilator. So feel free to join. I'll be sending around the invitation soon. And we won't forget Kishore, who's had his hand up patiently, maybe... Uh, Kishore, you can unmask yourself and we'll see what you look like, unless you're too shy. Well, he has put uh, his the <laughs> Good morning, Julie. You make everybody Good shy. Good morning. So. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm still a little bit uh, not <laughs> fresh up. Uh, Satyan, I just wanted to ask you uh, if you can touch upon the fact, uh, is there any difference between the medical INO and the industrial INO? And uh, to Julie, is this uh, increased risk of uh, uh, cancer due to uh, industrial or medical uh, nitric oxide? So over back to you. You first, Satyan. Okay. Um, uh, Kishore, I don't have a lot of experience with use of industrial I know. Uh, I have used it only before I know was available um, in, in 96, 97, and 98. And I have not used it in a long period of time. So I do not know the answer to your question. But the advantage of using medical grade I know is that it's already diluted with nitrogen and it's, it's a lot more pure with less toxicity. Other than that, I don't have a lot of experience using industrial nitric oxide. And Julie, back to you. Yeah, so same here, Kishore. So the um, output from this uh, paper was from New South Wales Babies and will all be medical nitric oxide. Okay, thank you. No worries. So um, we're basically out of time, Satyan, and it's almost bedtime for you. Um, so thank you so much. And if you're okay with me sharing the slides, I know people have been taking, um, you know, little snapshots of your, of your beautiful slides. If uh, you don't mind me sharing the recording of the talk, that will be amazing. Good, of course. Thank you so much. Thanks for hosting me, Julie. This was fun. Oh, this is wonderful. Thank you so much and hope it cools down soon. Uh, that's the last question. Uh, Dr. Sutton, massive fan of your illustrations. Oh, any comment on I don't know with non-invasive support? I think that's another talk in itself, isn't it? Well, that's a fascinating topic, Vinayak. Thank you for your kind comment. Um, use of non-invasive I know has really taken off quite a bit more recently. Um, there is no reason to intubate a patient to deliver nitric oxide. You can deliver it non-invasively either through a nasal cannula or CPAP. And the only difference is that you tend to expose the environment to slightly more nitric oxide. So you should be cognizant of that effect. And there are guidelines as to how much nitric oxide you can expose nurses and other people to when you use non-invasive INO. 
But the other thing to remember is that when you use non-invasive INO, especially with a nasal cannula, you may have to use slightly higher dose. We usually use 20 parts per million, assuming that there is some dilution and only roughly half of it gets to the alveolus. So the dose that you deliver in through a ventilator, through a uh, non-invasive method, may not be as high as what you would get with a endotracheal tube. So that's something for you to remember. But I use, I personally use a lot of non-invasive INO. I use it in uh, in babies with heart disease, babies with diaphragmatic hernia, following extubation. It's a very effective tool to selectively decrease uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, we had a baby last week in our unit who had significant LV dysfunction and high right ventricular afterload, but was extubated and, had, and was on cooling. And we went ahead and gave that baby nasal cannula nitric oxide with very fairly dramatic results in reducing RV afterload. So it's, it's a very effective way of using inhaled nitric oxide. I would much rather not tube a kid and use non-invasive NO if I can get away with that. That's amazing. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, oh, headache. Oh my God. Yes. Um, unless the dose goes very high, headaches, right? you, don't, you don't expose staff to high inhaled nitric oxide. The funny thing, Rajesh, is that when you're using the toxic industrial nitric oxide way back in the 90s, when you open the tank, you would see this brown gas come out and that was pure nitric oxide. And then many people in the room would get a headache. So that is, that is a concern. But with limited use of medical NO with appropriate dilution, it has not been an issue. Uh, the last so you question. want to take one every last question yeah. from Ahmed? We'll give him one. He's a nice guy. <laughs> Ahmed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> go, go, Ahmed. Uh, you can ask so the question perfect, yourself. Perfect. Thank you. Um, perfect talk, Satin, as always. Uh, my question is about weaning FI2 and nitric in um, CDH preoperatively or postoperatively. Um, given that these babies um, with CDH usually struggle for a while with PO2s and SATs, we'd have them in the 80s and we modify our targets to the 80s, but what do you do to wean your metric and FI2 in these babies or do you just continue post-operatively? Oh, that's a tough question. I mean, this is something we all struggle with, with uh, babies with diaphragmatic hernia because their pulmonary vascular resistance, as you know, tends to stay up high for a long period of time, even before and after surgery. So what I typically do is, um, I, based on the FiO2, I adjust PaO2. Uh, if the FiO2 is pretty high, I tolerate SATs in the high 80s, low 90s, and tend to be much more lung protective. On the other hand, if the FiO2 needs are not high, then I tolerate slightly higher PaO2 and, and SpO2 values. But if a baby is stuck on nitric and FiO2 and things are not weaning well, I really like using either sildenafil or mildenone based on cardiac function. And in my experience, use of one of these compounds has been very beneficial in weaning these babies, reducing their FiO2 and also weaning nitric oxide. If these babies have LV dysfunction or RV dysfunction, I prefer to use mildenone. If their function is good, then I prefer to use IV sildenafil. And they usually use a combination of one of these two to help babies wean down on nitric or FiO2. If not, even with that, you're absolutely right. There are quite a few babies who are stuck on nitric and FiO2. The problem, as all of us know, is if you leave a baby on nitric for more than 24 hours, the ability of the endogenous pulmonary vasculature to produce its own nitric oxide tends to get suppressed pretty fast, and they become dependent on nitric oxide and weaning nitric oxide becomes very difficult. And that's the thing I'm really nervous about. So if things are not going well within six hours of starting NO, I try to use some other agent to bring down FiO2 and bring down nitric oxide. I hate to leave these babies on 100% O2 and nitric for a long period of time. I know I did not answer your question, but that's an indirect way of saying something that I don't know the answer to your question. It's great, thank you so much. <laughs> it was a very eloquent, I don't know, answer to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you so much, guys. All right, um, so I think we better wrap it up because um, it's way past time, but amazing talk as usual. And um, if you have any questions, I think you feel free to contact Satyan directly, I hope. Is that okay? Sure, of course, yeah. That would be thank a you pleasure so much. to answer. And thank you very much, uh, Julie. It was a wonderful, lively audience and I thank you all for staying and uh, 
uh, connecting with me for this particular. In California and all the best. Good night. And, and warmer in Sydney. Bye. Thank you. Yes. Bye, everyone. Bye.